Welcome to They That Hope with Father Dave and Bob, seeing humor and hope in a crazy world. And I'm Bob. And I'm Father Dave. And where are you? I am in the Granite State. Do you know what that state is? You you belittle me by making that statement. <laughs> of course, well, it doesn't I have do. a base. Doesn't have a baseball team, so I just didn't know if. Well, I guess. What is the baseball team up here? I guess the it Red could Sox. Be the Red Sox. I would yeah, think so. I would think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not not the Yankees so much, but you never know. Oh, I am no, in New no, Hampshire. No. Beautiful. For those of you so. uh, listening, and if you're watching it, you can see a beautiful lake behind me. My and mom it, has a place up in New Hampshire, and uh, we come up here for a little bit every summer, which is awesome. Yeah, and if you're watching, you also see I have a white wall behind <laughs> me, so I'm I'm in my in the friary actually. You live a very Spartan lifestyle. That's great. So it's, you're it, you're away. It's your vow of poverty. It is. You're away on vacation a little bit, and that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. and we come up here, and my kids go to a really cool uh, Catholic camp uh, that's in the Diocese of Manchester. Uh, camp Fatima is an all boys camp, and Camp Bernadette is an all girls camp. And that's so, awesome. um, all my kids at different points in their lives have gone there. Actually, my oldest son John is working there all summer. He's the that's liturgical cool. director. Uh, which is super fun. And then my youngest is going for his first time, Aiden David. Uh, he is seven years old. He's going to be eight, actually, at the end of camp. It's a two-week camp. But he was uh, so excited. And it was, like, really hard to let him go, though. You know, it's like, Was oh. he at all nervous? Not really. I mean, he's heard so many great stories oh, from sure, his sure, siblings. Sure. And the fact that John is there is really cool. And then Joey's there. Actually, Joey goes as long as he can. Joey uh, is, is going to be there for six weeks because he oh, just good. absolutely goes crazy at camp. I mean, not having camp last summer was one of the real hardships for all of the kids because they've just made so many friends and so many great memories uh, through these Catholic camps. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've just seen them mature. You know, now, did you, you did you did you grow up with camps as a part of your growing up? No, my only okay. camp experience was watching meatballs on television. What yeah. about you? Um, well, we camped a lot, but like official camps or things. No, nothing like that. Oh, yeah. you like went out in tents? Do you, you know mean? now? Yeah, now that you mention it, I think one of my friends was a part of Young Life, and he. he I never went with him, but I, as soon as you mentioned that, I remember him talking about going to camp. But that was never a part of my life growing up at all. Yeah. yeah, Young Life camps are more like what they would call today glamping. <laughs> like oh, really? Just, Is it really? Okay. Oh, they're gorgeous. I mean, they are so nice. I mean, I bet they might have some backpacking tours or something like that, but for the most part. You know, it's a really nice cabin. It's a beautiful pool. It's lots of cool activities. They're they're pretty amazing. Life teen camps are similar uh, to to that. They they do really great jobs. So, but, but yeah, here record, in New Hampshire, just for the record, there's yeah. nothing there's nothing wrong with glamping every now and then. I, I think actually glamping should be the standard. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's me. Well, and my guess is, is, is even that. Your idea of glamping and my idea of glamping, <laughs> probably. <laughs> like, my idea of glamping actually means the outdoors. Yours may be a window an open op in your hotel. Open door. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah some, a nice view. Though you'll be really proud of me. So uh, one of the things I just got was a telescope. And um, oh, I've, been, I've been taking it out at night. So I, like, douse myself in bug spray. And off I go in the darkness. And it's really amazing. You know, when you look up at the sky and you see those little pinpricks of light, when you put a telescope on it, it looks like a slightly larger pinprick of light. I'm still yeah. trying to figure out how to use it, and I'm sure there's other cool things to find, but right now I'm still uh, just getting used to it. It's, like, so sensitive. Like, you move it, like, a little inch, and you're in another galaxy. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, work on that. But, but that is pretty cool. My, my father had one growing up, and even not that long ago, when the Bethlehem star was there, and... I think it was Jupiter and Saturn were aligned. You could, I mean, we could see the rings around the planet. Yeah. It was, it was very cool. It was very cool. That's yeah. good. And if yeah. nothing else, you can just look into your neighbor's house and there's windows. Yes, there's, actually, yeah. that's actually one of the things it says not to do in the book. Oh, it does. You know, like, oh, right, scratch yeah, that. It, it, it encourages, <laughs> it encourages privacy. It says, though you could look into another person's house, that's yeah. not polite. So you're like on that. vacation then. And, and I think we were saying this is the first time in I don't know how long that you haven't done a conference. Obviously, other than COVID, but. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a little weird. So uh, my good friend and sidekick, John Paul Von Arks, is leading the worship music for the youth conferences this year. And I am not. And that's the first time in a good 15 or 16 years, other than COVID, mm -hmm. uh, that I haven't been doing music at youth conferences. And I got to tell you, it's, it's a little... It's a little weird, you know. It's hard to hard to let things go. I mean, um, you know, the first time, the first weekend, I was home and I knew there was a, a conference on campus and I wasn't there. I did like crash the social a little bit, but then yeah. I boogied out because it still felt like yeah, I don't want to be that guy that just kind of keeps hanging yeah, hours yeah. the night, you know. Like I just, yeah, it's all right. It, it's cool. Uh, but thankfully, I'm still a part of youth conferences. I'm still hosting them. I'm really excited. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to go out to Springfield, Missouri. Oh, good. And good, good. I'll host a I'll host a conference out there. Good. Don't totally go to the Bass Pro Shop. It's a great store there. Um, the other thing is we crashed your house since you were gone last weekend. We just totally, <laughs> yeah, I said everybody's invited. We, yeah, so yeah, we appreciate that. All, all are welcome. So right. blessings to all you listeners. I know uh, many of you might actually be on vacation yourself. I hope you're getting uh, some rest. I hope you're getting a break. Uh, you know, kids are pretty much out of school at this point, you know, as we're heading into the end of June. Most uh, school systems are shut down right. and the summer has begun. Okay. Growing up, Robert, your most memorable vacation, what would that be? Well, we'd always go to the Cape. I shared the uh, tragic barn of fun story, yes, I think, yes, a couple yes. podcasts ago. But going to the Cape was always really, uh, really special. But <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm laughing because one of my favorite memories is my aunt and uncle used to take me to a toy store and I would get a Star Wars toy. And that was, well, that was I, pretty exciting. I, yeah, I didn't see oh, that. Oh, no, time. wait. I know exactly what it was. So there was one time I was at, on the Cape and my dad was reading the newspaper and he said, uh, you know, he said, do you know who Peter Mayhew is? I said, yeah, he's, you know, Chewbacca. And then he said, do you know who Kenny Baker is? I'm, I'm like, yeah, he's R2-D2. And uh, he muttered something about how much of a disappointment I was. Uh, but I said, why are you asking this? He said, well, apparently they're signing autographs at the movie theater down the street in Cape Cod. So I was like, when? And he's like, today. So I like just grab the car keys and I fly out there thinking there's going to be this mob scene of people. And I go into the movie lobby and it is, um, Peter Mayhew who, who played Chewbacca. He's a huge human being, seven foot two, Kenny Baker, who was physically in R2D2. So he was a very small person, uh, Warwick Davis who played wicket, the Ewok, uh, and also Willow, the star of Willow. Let us not forget. Or wait, was he Willow? Well, he was the main character. Bob, keep um, going. he was yeah. sitting next to him. Uh, David Prowse, who played Darth Vader, again, wow. another huge guy, and Jeremy Bullock, who was the guy inside of Boba Fett. Uh, I guess there was a convention nearby called Star Wars, The Men in the Masks, uh, and they were just trying to do some side hustle thing where you could get autographs, and uh, it was me and them. So I was so nervous. You know, I got their autographs, and then at the end, I got to Jeremy Bullock, the guy who played Boba Fett, and he was the coolest guy ever. He was British. A lot of them actually are British. And uh, he's like, so what are you doing now? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, well, have a seat. And just sat down next to him and probably talked to him for like a good 20 minutes. I mean, after kind of like the, oh, I'm talking to Boba Fett, wore off. Uh, it was just a great conversation. And he was a really, really cool dude. So I have, uh, I have all their autographs hanging at my house. And it's uh, one of my favorite vacation memories of all time. And once again, our lives are so profoundly different. <laughs> all right, all right. What was yours? I went did, to Yellowstone did, and I did, saw a geyser. No, you know something. Actually, I, I, the, I don't know. We we had just we had some really wonderful, beautiful family vacations. But you know something? Just what made me think of it is there's some uh, a family from California. They graduated maybe about twelve years ago, and they drove six kids in their minivan from California to Steubenville, then they're going to go on to Boston, then go down to Florida. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, wow. there's nothing <laughs> I think would be more miserable than that. But they were like, again, they were so excited and having a blast. And then yeah. uh, this, this is a conversation I had with my parents and, and I had it as I grew up realizing that, you know, family vacations were great for kids, but for moms and dads, that's not always the case, right? We drove, yeah, you always need a vacation from your vacation. Yeah, we drove uh, in one one Christmas vacation from Colorado to Miami, and we did kind of oh this, this house swap. We were in Clearwater for a while and then went on to Miami for yeah. uh, the Notre Dame, uh, Alabama, Orange Bowl, which Notre Dame won. I just put that out there. Uh, but no, we, we generally took... Was that the last time they won a bowl game? 
just to ask, if, just, if we could cut asking. that if we could cut that out that's <laughs> the meanest thing i think anyone's ever said to me good grief i can't believe you actually said that i, I they just don't win bowl games i, I hear stop it I, just, I don't really follow college that's right why don't you just keep it that way okay you, little, okay, you stick good. to your little star wars stories okay <laughs> But no, but so I'm, I'm very, very grateful for family vacations. We had wonderful vacations, some simple, not some so simple, but I'm also really, really grateful for a mom and dad who, who, who do things like that. And it's wonderful for the kids, but it's probably stressful for the moms and dads. So if you moms and dads are out there, you're planning your kids vacations, uh, send us an email, (laughs) send us an email (laughs) and we will intercede for you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. hey speaking of vacation which reminds me of the movie i'm, I'm also reminiscent of our time i think it was la- it was last year in uh tennessee that you and i drove to dolly world and it was closed yes, we did we did but, well, yeah. <laughs> but we got we right knew, up to the gate we knew it was we closed. knew it was closed yeah, yeah everybody yeah, listening yeah. We're, we're not that dumb we, yeah, we yeah. knew it was closed but yeah. it was true and also speaking of florida gosh our prayers uh for that just horrible yeah yeah horrible God bless collapse them. and Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Bobby, and I, just, live... and I just yeah. talked to someone the day before. He's in Steubenville. He's visiting. Uh, his uncle and aunt were at that apartment center, and they're, they haven't been seen. So it's just... Oh, my gosh. It, it, it put a face to this for me. So, yeah, we just want to pray for the people who who've, who are, have lost loved ones, who don't know what's going on in just the midst of that tragedy. We just want to let people know. Can You know, I, I, I will say, though, I was joking about... Actually, I'm not joking about writing us and saying we'll pray for your vacation. But in some ways, that has become part of, I think, what our ministry in this podcast is for, is is we have people who write and they ask us to pray and we pray as friars and, and just people like... So when we say that, we're not just joke. Well, we're joking, but we're right. also serious that we, we would love to be able to pray for you. So please uh, let us know. We'd like to do that for you. Yeah, send us an email at hope at franciscan.edu. That's hope at franciscan.edu. Okay, and the last word um, on vacations, no. Last word on vacation oh. is the, that movie, uh, National Lampoon Vacation. The original one right. was filmed in my hometown. Yeah, I think you said yeah, that earlier. Yeah, yeah, so Christy Brinkley and uh, what was the other guy's name? Uh, Christy's the one Chevy that I Chase. remember most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Chevy Chase, right, right. I think there was a guy named Chevy Chase. Yeah, I think you know, he was in that, that too, so. so there you go. You know, it's funny, and we were talking about meatballs, too. Like, I saw all of those movies on television. I'd, like, record them on my Betamax and watch them. And then when I actually saw, like, the, the R-rated version, yeah, yeah. I'd be like, oh, crud. Yeah, like, what yeah. is, you know, Caddyshack, meatball, like, all those stuff. I really enjoyed the edited versions of it. You're and not wrong. Later on, I was like, yikes. You're not anyway. wrong. You're not wrong. Hey, let's talk about uh, Franciscan University, of course, who brings us the podcast. At Franciscan, our sports aren't just limited to NCAA athletics, uh, which we, by the way, have some really great NCAA athletics there, mm-hmm. but not football, speaking of college football. Yep. Even if even if there is a Division three college football? Yep. I don't know. No. Oh, okay. But even more popular by sheer numbers are Franciscan's intramural sports. Nearly 900 students enjoy spirited competition in basketball, volleyball, badminton, <laughs> that's still a thing, and flag football. My dad played badminton, actually, now that I think of it. Plus action sports like soccer tennis, spike ball, kickball, ultimate frisbee, and of course, everybody's favorite, can jam. I think actually Ultimate Frisbee is everybody's favorite. That's that, more that's, my favorite. That's absolutely the case. That's a great. What, Can Jam or no, no, Ultimate no, no. Frisbee? No, Ultimate Frisbee. It's, it's so much fun. Yeah. Yep. Oh, my gosh. I remember when I was a student, uh, yeah, we were, yeah, people go crazy about Ultimate Frisbee. It's really, really it's fun. It's really good. Yep. But I guess Can Jam's the new Ultimate Frisbee. You it's, know what that is? Yeah, I do. I do. You throw a Frisbee in a little, it looks can. like a trash can type thing, and you can get it into a, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. But it's not as fun as most. You know, if they, if they painted it like a droid, it would be way more popular. Keep going, Bob. Keep I'm just, going. I'm throwing that out Keep there. Going. Intramurals are a great way to unwind from studies and build friendships. And as has been the tradition for decades, all intramural games end with both teams in prayer. Father Dave, I hear the friars sometimes take on the students in cornhole. This, Oh, that's a true statement. Actually, the friars participate often <laughs> in the in intramurals. But yes, we're pretty good. Especially, it's funny, during COVID, we played cornhole by the hours in the evenings when nobody was oh, really? on the campus was quiet yeah so 
I'm not going to say we're professional, but we're close. We're close. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you knew, I mean, I, I knew sports was really suffering when the only thing that was showing on ESPN was competitive cornhole. And we were you know, watching. And, like, and we're watching yeah. it because there was nothing else to watch. And now I feel like, particularly this time of year, I my sports brain goes a little crazy because, you know, I like the NBA and they're heading in the finals. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping on the Suns bandwagon That's a good right place now, to be. Way. That's a good place to be. Um. NHL, uh, Stanley Clef playoffs, Tampa Bay's in it again. So, uh, you know, the continual dominance of Tampa Bay sports, the Lightning are playing the Canadians. The Go Montreal Canadians. Canadians. That's, right. that's why I've, they're my favorite team. Really? <laughs> well, the last time they were in the, in the Stanley Cup playoffs was 1993. Oh, oh. Which was, which was around the time Notre Dame won a bowl game. Oh, here we go oh. again. I see a thing. Oh, I see Let's move thing. on. Yep. Yeah, anyway. So, uh, but you can check out all that and more franciscan.edu. That's franciscan.edu. And the sports the sports life on campus, both NCAA and intramurals is really really fun. Amen. Amen. So, um, here's one of the things that I think we're going to chat about, and it's one of the things I've been thinking about, and praying about, and I think I'll probably eventually write something a little bit. Is so we've got some major issues going on. We've got have you been following the board, the school board all, all across the country, the school board meetings largely around critical race theory? I mean, people are just going crazy about that. I, I see a lot of pictures of angry people. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I, maybe, I, don't, I haven't really been following it. Okay. Though, maybe, but, yeah. maybe, you know, in a future podcast, we'll talk and just discuss the yeah, whole idea. Yeah, kind of dive into that, uh, a that a little bit more. But so there's been that's going, been going on, and there's a couple of recent states. Actually, the Supreme Court just took up a new abortion a uh, case that, you know, God willing, they really uh, turn the tide on, on Roe versus Wade. And then the other is all the transgendered issues that are going on. And one of the things that I've been praying and thinking about that at the heart of all of those is ultimately the question about how we see the human person. And and more and more, and, and I'm, I was trying to remember who it was with a quote that was saying so many of the heresies and struggles that we're looking at in the world today really revolve around our inability to recognize and see the beauty and the goodness of the human person. So for each one of those that, you know, the groups that largely only see themselves as race or the color of their skin, and that's how you define people. And because you're one color, you have a superiority or a privilege over another and all these kinds of things. Transgender, the individual who believes that they can define themselves, that just because a man is born with certain chromosomes or, or a woman, that that isn't what defines them, but the individual defines them. So at the heart of all of this, is this craziness that the human person has to have control and to dominate and to yeah. be able to define themselves rather than the reality is that we're ultimately defined by God. And they're, they're, they're heresies against the human person, ra- lacking to see the dignity, the beauty, the goodness of the human person. And I see a common thread in so many of the major issues that are going on and just an inability to recognize um, the human person and what the human person is. You know, something... Um... That I mean, there's so many things that I love in the catechism, but one of the first times I read through it, um, when it talked about creation, the catechism says that um, a catechesis on creation is of major importance. Yeah. And I remember that that kind of, you know, I thought, you know, well, maybe a, a, te- a catechesis on the Eucharist would be major importance or a catechesis yeah. on, you know, but no, and it said it's of major importance because it's the foundation of everything else that we learn and it and it just shapes the entire way we we see the world i remember i was doing a a confirmation retreat i didn't know it was a confirmation retreat uh they didn't tell me it was a mandatory confirmation retreat oh, they just said oh yeah talk to our young people those are the words. Yeah. <laughs> especially when they sneak up on you and i could just tell by the body language i'm like are these kids forced to be here they're like no they're not forced to be here well they can't get confirmation if they don't come i'm like yeah. okay that's called forced yeah, yeah. uh to to be there and um, they had this whole thing. They wanted me to talk about, like, the gifts of the Spirit and other things. And, I mean, three minutes into it, I could tell, like, just crickets, no engagement. So I said, all right, everybody, I'm just going to talk about something else. And they're like, oh, that's interesting. And I just started talking about being created, you know. And I asked the question. I said, do you think you were created out of luck or you were created out of love? Because how you answer that question, it will significantly shape your understanding of yourself and the world around you. Absolutely. And they broke into small groups and it broke my heart. You know, I talked to the small group later, leaders during lunch and they were saying a good 60% of them thought luck. It just kind of happened, well, you know, just kind of yeah, happened. Yeah, it Absolutely. just kind of happened. Well, if it, if it did kind of happen, then 
sure, you know, like whatever gender you want to be, fine, you know, or however you want to define yourself, fine. I mean, if it's just evolution, if there was no plan, if there's no purpose, evolution is just survival of the fittest. You know, it's a very individualistic focus, mm -hmm. uh, even you know, even the idea of preserving others for the sake of the species is still just focused on, in a sense, yourself. And uh, I think that permeates our culture far more than we realize. And I think it's something that many times we who are spiritual, we just take for granted yeah. that people know that they were made in God's image and likeness, that they know that they were made, you know, by love, for love, and to love. And there's a big population, even if they kind of learn that in school, uh, that's not... That's just not the philosophy. That's just yeah. not the, the way they're thinking of themselves. Well, and it's interesting, too, because I was thinking, I mean, when you were talking, I was thinking, you know, the, the what, you know, the what we are, that part is settled. And, and it's the why. And, and science can answer the what, right? What are we? And yet even that is, is today, you know, is what, what makes a male or what makes, I mean, even those fundamental questions that we wouldn't have even considered 25 years ago, but it's it's just become ludicrous, right? But then the other yeah. is that either extreme, you know, that that we, we yesterday was a feast of Irenaeus, the human person, the glory of God is a human person fully alive, right? Yeah. Was that yesterday? I think. Yeah, I that think. was Monday. Okay. Yesterday okay. was Peter and Paul. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's be right. a good thing to talk about too. Well, let's, all right, we'll, we'll finish with that. But just that, you know, so either extreme, you know, on, on one extreme, there the human value is dependent on what a person holds to be true, right? So if, if the baby is now inconvenient, well, then you abort it. Or if it doesn't fit into your yeah. plans and you abort it as if it's disposable. So this, this profound dismissal of the value and the beauty and the goodness. Or then the other is, is this, this highlight that makes the human person worth anything else, you know, um, more important than that we worship the human body, right? We worship this body. And, and we have to have a fundamental, I think, a shift. And I think your word is right, uh, Bob this catechesis on creation and the beauty of creation and, and why God created and, and, and how we continue to participate in that creation. And I don't know, I'm just more and more, yeah, more and more convinced that so many of the ills that we have is bad theology and a bad understanding of the nature of the human person. Yeah. And I would even say, you know, a lot of our problems aren't so much theological, but philosophical, you yeah, know, yeah. just, just and the understanding of what is yeah. truth anthropological anthropological yeah. is an absolutely huge one i mean yeah. who would have thought even just a scripture like uh, made in the image and likeness of god male and female he created them would be so scandalous yeah. uh in in the world today but i mean the beauty of it is that god is sharing uh truth with us you know i think sometimes uh people kind of on the other side of the argument you know why are you trying to force yourself and force these issues on people i mean they see it as a kind of cruelty and at the heart of it, you know, even though there's a lot of messed up stuff, there's, you know, like I, I know some people who are very supportive of transgender rights and, and their concern is, look, we want to support transgender people because we want them to find happiness. And there's such a huge suicide rate among transgenders as well. You know, they're, you know, in one way, it's almost an attitude of, well, if we just give everybody what they want and let everybody do what they're going to do, then everybody's going to be happy. Yeah. And that's not but see, Bob, life, that's, and yeah, that's not right. the revelation of God. Right, right. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that I'm, you know, I've, I've heard that statistic, and it's spoken of a lot. But in, in this, I want to tread really carefully here, and, and probably should think more a little bit. But, you know, the reality is is that the suicide rate is, is high among that population. Yeah. And, but the other part is also true in that th there's been more exposure and more acceptance of that population than there ever has been. So one would think that, as as society is being more not only being accepted being celebrated i mean the reality now is is for the individual who speaks out against that is the one who's going to be ostracized but yeah. but but the suicide rate isn't getting better so the confusion doesn't seem to be being fixed it's just it i think it, it leads into when you, when we lead away and walk away and close our mind and our ears to the beauty of god's design and the way we've been created and the way that he he wants his plan to come about, it's just going to lead to more more destruction and more frustration and more hurt and more pain. It's just you're right. There's this this. I think the evil one is cloaked it in just being nice or accepting or empathetic, yeah. and and ultimately it's not it's not serving them well. It's not serving the human the person. Not serving the human person yeah. well. But but to, but and, but the other part, real quick. The other part is 
is that we we should love you know we should reach out to that individual who's yeah. so it's not it's not a either or but it's it's reaching out in love and also in truth and in beauty and goodness and and that we find that and as you said in the catechism in the beauty of creation right and that is the challenge i think for disciples of christ you know you can hear about it as an issue and we can get mad at it and we can blog about it and do things but uh, there's people involved. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely what are we doing? right. Absolutely right. What are we doing to accompany people who are struggling? How are we loving? How are we in conversation with? How are we in better understanding? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, another thing I think the devil would want us to do is to to treat people who are struggling with their gender identity, with their sexual identity, you know, as well, lepers and yeah, yeah, ostracize yeah, yeah. them and just keep them away because their agenda is going to ruin the world. And, <clears throat> And and that's the other extreme of well, where the and devil that's exactly laughs right, and just right. continues to divide. Is, is that what we just said is that the individual doesn't define male or female, and yet there's a tendency that we define them as well those people, yeah. and we define yeah. them by their transgendered or by their and in the same way they they are a son or daughter of God and they deserve charity and respect and and that we care for them the same way the Lord cares for them. So that's, yeah, we, we unfortunately at times do the same thing to them that we don't want them to do to themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah, Yeah. no, no, exactly. I mean, we're all weak and we're all sinful and we're all trying, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's why, again, God's revelation. We just need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. I think that's actually a really cool lesson just to tie into the feast that we had yesterday of Peter and Paul. I think sometimes we underestimate the tension between Gentiles and Jews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what a great model of both Peter and Paul, you know, one, you know, really Peter being seen as the apostle to the Jews and Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles. But I mean, back in the time of Christ, like a Jew would not walk into a Gentile's house, would not even use a utensil that a Gentile used. I mean, it was such a sharp divide. And for Peter to enter into a Gentile's house and baptize Gentiles and eat unclean food, I mean, was just... Like today, we're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Of course, you should have done that sooner. But like, you know, part of Christianity no. was bringing about great unity in a culture that was seriously, seriously divided. No, and I don't think, I, again, it's just the world that we've lived in. I don't yet think we fully understand how monumental those first, you know, 20 years of the church with Peter and Paul and, and Paul going to the Gentiles. And like, this is this is just a whole new world, way of looking at the world and looking at God and understanding who God is and, and who his chosen people are. And, and that's, you know, if you take a look at the early church, that's the tension that, that exists in the church. But we've kind of take it for granted. It's like, well, yeah, Peter and Paul. Well, those were pretty significant things that they had to work through. Yeah, yeah. And they did work through them. You know, uh, you know growing up in, um, you know, around a lot of evangelical Protestants, sometimes I kind of heard a vibe of like, well, the Catholics are like the church of Peter, but the Protestants are the church of Paul. Mm-hmm. And what beautiful it is that uh, though they're, they, they had some, you know, disagreements that were articulated in Scripture, um, it's always been the feast of Peter and Paul. Like Peter doesn't have his own feast day. Yeah. I mean, there's a feast for the throne of Peter, but that's more about the succession and the authority and the papacy. Mm-hmm. And there is a feast for the conversion of St. Paul, so I guess he gets kind of a different day. But in terms of who they are and the day we celebrate, we always celebrate them together. And I think that says something really profound mm-hmm. about the unity of these two very different people uh, who are ministering to two very different groups, and yet we're proclaiming the same message and coming together and um, right. yeah, and, we're just and, and united had, in faith. And had to work through. I mean, we see this in the scripture. I had to work through disagreements and, and disagreements, but then also understanding what is the church, what does it look like, you know, in this, yeah. in, in, in the death and resurrection, the sending of the Holy Spirit, what does it look like to live this faith? And, and they were, they were figuring things out. And again, the spirit of God was leading and directing them, but leading both of them, right? Leading Peter and leading Paul and, and the early, some of the early questions, what does it mean? Uh, to the Gentiles to become Christian? What does it mean as far as their uh, paying attention and faithfulness to Jewish custom and tradition and ritual? Those were yeah. those were some major, major issues. And tough issues. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just pulled up a really, a, a quote I love from uh, Pope Benedict, where he's talking about how some people want to pit Peter against Paul, and they're talking about that moment where Paul called Peter out because Peter went back to eating the kosher food and going back to the Jewish ways. And Pope Benedict wrote this. He said, in fact, the thoughts of Paul on one hand and of Peter and 
and Barnabas on the other were different. For the latter, Paul, or Peter and Barnabas, the separation from Gentiles was a way to safeguard and not shock believers who came from Judaism. And so he was suggesting that, you know, if Peter was going back to kosher foods, it was because he was ministering to Gentile, or he's ministering to Jews. So he's not going to walk up to a Jew with a piece of bacon and be like, hey, you know, like yeah, exactly. just totally shock them. Exactly. But for Paul, on the other hand, it constituted a danger of a misunderstanding of the universal salvation of Christ. It was almost like Peter didn't realize how important he was. And it's a similar thing that we do with all the popes, right? If a pope celebrates a liturgy a certain way, everybody goes, well, that's the way we're supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we kind of swing or, to or whatever, like, the, right, right, right. whatever the Pope is doing. Right. Well, yeah. And, and I think that, yeah, that, that that's important. But I was going to say something about Peter and Paul. Oh, but the fact that they disagreed and we don't have to pick one or the other. Is, is, yeah. the, is that we celebrate both of them and that tension is okay. We, uh, there was a guy visiting this weekend and he was giving a, a talk at a conference that we're holding. And one of the things he was talking about was in many ways what you were just saying. What he's doing is he's taking a look at the thought of John Paul, Benedict, and Francis. And he's talking about how the three of those complement each other. And there's a way yeah. that sometimes we want to separate and divide and, and, and they're actually there's a lot of ways that they come together and it's the same way with Peter and Paul and, and I think you expressed it beautifully is the centrality of Christ now what does that look like and how do we live that out and I think that's where pastoral theology comes into play right what is the pastoral response to to eating a piece of bacon in front of a Jewish community were you free to do it <laughs> were you free to do it sure you were free to do it was that a good pastoral decision probably not and I think right. that's that's one of the things that, that that at times we we lose sight of that. That yeah, that there's a pastoral response. Yeah, we can response. get so caught up in um, being right yeah, yeah. and making the argument. And this goes back to what we we're saying earlier that we forget uh, the person who's struggling or the person who might need just more of an on ramp yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, to yeah. the revelation of God. I mean, it's so beautiful that God first appeared to Moses as a burning bush. Not because God is a burning bush, but that's just about as much as Moses could mm -hmm. take initially. And uh, eventually, uh, Moses is seeing God face to face like a friend. Yeah. And I, I think of my own journey. You know, if I knew God as I knew him now, back when I was a teenager, I probably would have freaked and run the other way, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and God is just so kind and so gentle. But, but and again, it's and, the presence. And that's, I think, really important, Bob, is that the spiritual life is a growth in understanding who God is. That's not to say that God changes, but the way that we understand him. And so much of my understanding of God has changed. I gave a talk at the Priest Deacon's, no, maybe it was a Power and Purpose conference earlier in the year, that I said, if we haven't ever had this encounter with the Lord, they go, oh my goodness, this image that I had of you, it's just not right. It's just not true. That that if, if we haven't had ever heard the Lord say to us, you know, that's not who I am, or that's not the kind of God I am, then that means our understanding of God isn't developing. That's not to say that God is changing, but our understanding right. of him should grow and develop and become more pure and more true. And and a danger is this this sense that, well, I've got him all figured out. There's nothing else that he yeah. wants to reveal himself to me. And, and that's simply, that's that's crazy. Yeah, that turns God into a concept yeah, and yeah. not a living person. I right. mean, I just celebrated, speaking of Feast of St. Ernest, I just celebrated my 24th wedding anniversary. Which oh, is did awesome. You really? And uh, did you get my yeah, text? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super cool. Uh, I no, I'm, I must have missed that. Did you send it? You have bad service in New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that's the issue. Yeah, but you know, even it. with even with her being married 24 years, you know, I know her, but she still surprises me. I yeah. mean, I I couldn't say, oh yeah, I've got her locked in a box, you know, because she's yeah. not a concept. She's a person, and yeah. the Trinity are three divine persons. You yeah, know, when and I was... there's a. There's a mystery to it in a beautiful way. When I was a student, uh, I took a course on the philosophy of love by um, uh, Alice von Hildebrand, uh, Diedrich von Hildebrand's wife. And um, one of the things she said was that. She said that, that the nature of love is mystery. And, and as you grow in your love of somebody, that mystery is revealed. Now, she was talking about God, but then she talked about her relationship with her husband. And she said that mm -hmm. that's true in any relationship that is truly loving is the more you love, that mystery is slowly revealed in it, and it excites you. It, it it attracts you again as you begin to discover more of that. And and I always tell the, the university students, I think one of the danger is this this false sense of okay, I have to just tell you everything about myself so you know everything about me. <laughs> um, let that let that grow and develop. And I think it's really a beautiful beautiful journey. And the same thing happens with our relationship with the Lord. 
Amen. Amen. Well, shall we close with prayer? I think that's not a bad idea. Um, how about you lead us? Okay. Yeah. I would be honored to. Good. In uh, the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Lord God, we just ask that you would lead us deeper into your mystery of love. We ask that you would gently reveal to us um, our sin, particularly any sins against love, mm. our sins of judgment towards others, uh, the times that we have kept others at arm distance, at arm length, because we considered them unclean. Mm. Lord God, just have mercy on us. Amen. You came to seek and save the lost. You uh, are a friend of sinners, and we acknowledge that we are sinners in need of your love and need of your grace. Only by your Spirit can you unite your family, your people, different tribes, races, everything, uh, personalities, countries, and yet all one church and in one body, which is yours. So, mm -hmm. Lord, uh, send your mercy and love upon us, and may Saints Peter and Paul not only be an example for us of unity, uh, but intercede for us uh, that we could be one. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the Lord Amen. bless our listeners, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good vacation, Amen. Bob. Uh, I'll talk to you hey. next week from Austria. Oh, well, that's the answer to where is the world will Father Dave Pavanka be? Oh, I, I guess I could to, have left that uh, one to get, out. Can you get it? Could you get a different background? Could we not? Could we like see a mountain or something in the background? We'll we'll find out if that can happen. Hey, everybody! Thanks again for uh, being a part of this podcast. And as we mentioned earlier, please email us hope at franciscan.edu. Hope at franciscan.edu. God bless. Yeah.